Hello, welcome to uh, Victory of the Darkness Lesson 4. As, as previously stated in Lesson 3, we had a couple technical issues the last couple weeks where like 8 minutes of the class got recorded when I spoke for a lot more than 8 minutes. Um, so, I'm re-recording uh, the lessons from home. Uh, there might be some uh, heat blowing in the background or who knows what will happen. Maybe my cat will uh, chime in later. Um, but right now we're gonna we're gonna do our best to, to teach what we taught last night um, and I, I just want to thank everyone for their interest and their patience um, uh, with these technical difficulties I did not know that uh, that they existed and I hope uh, it hasn't turned anyone away from this discipleship path um, last night I asked the, the students last night when we began class I said you know I asked two questions I asked uh, how many believe that you're a sinner? And I asked for a show of hands. How many believe that you're a sinner? Well, guess what? Everyone's hands went up when I asked that question. And then I asked the next question. How many believe you were, you are a saint? Well, about half of the students believe they were a saint. So apparently, you know, we're going to work on this, this sainthood uh, issue today. Because as the Bible states, uh, Paul addresses, you know, the, the church as the saints and, you know, Corinth or Colossae or, or wherever. So, you know, saints is not a term um, to describe a spiritual juggernaut uh, of a faith. It is to describe a believer in Christ. Um, you know, so why do, why do people believe uh, or have a problem believing that they are a saint? Why do they believe they are a sinner rather than, than a saint? Well, there's a couple reasons for that. Um, the first one is uh, that some have never been taught any differently. Um, in my old tradition, uh, Catholicism, you know, not for nothing, um, the Hail Mary declares that we're a sinner. Pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. You know, sin, sin, sin. One thing I definitely got through my Catholic upbringing was that uh, I was a sinner. And it was so well taught to me that I, I really didn't have any um, assurance that I'd ever be saved. And I was really concerned with my salvation. Um in my time in, in, in the Catholic Church, and I, I honestly didn't believe I was, I was going to go to heaven. I believed I was going to go to hell. Um, the only thing I really held on to for hope was the, uh, the Nicene Creed that said one baptism was, is for, for the forgiveness of sin, and I would turn to my mother and say, Mom, I was baptized, right? Um, because there was, no, there, was no, um, there was no real assurance of my salvation. And God wants to be wants you to know that you are saved. That you, if you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you are assured of your salvation. You are in the kingdom of God, and He's given you spiritual life. Now, if you haven't heard that, that's what our class is to to teach. That you know, basically, when you when you come to Christ, you are forgiven of all your sins, and you're made righteous through the imputation of His righteousness upon you. Um, that means you're not only saved and um, justified, you are also sanctified the moment you're, you come into the kingdom. So if you haven't been taught, you know, never taught that you were a saint, you know, how are you ever going to say you're a saint? And like I said, in my old tradition, the Catholic Church, you know, the saints were the, the spiritual superstars, you know, the people who did amazing works and, and everything and earned their sainthood. Um, biblically, the people who come to Christ is, are saints. Um you know, others uh, don't identify with that saint title because they think it would be prideful to think of themselves as saints. Not me. I'm just, you know, a lowly sinner saved by grace. Um, like I said, I, uh, we are called out and we are made righteous. And so we are rightfully identified as saints. And it's not a prideful thing. Um, many believe that the label sinner believe, uh, better describes their present condition. They sin, so they must be sinner. Um, that's true. Um, you know, basically, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. We, we are saints who sin, you know, there, there is saints. We are saints. We, we do sin. We're being, we're being, being changed. We're being made righteous. We're, we're, we have been saved. We're being saved. We have been sanctified. We're being sanctified. Uh, faith is a dynamic thing. Now, if we live in our, uh, our sin all the time, we're not going to really feel spiritually alive. We're not going to feel like we're saints, you know, even if we've, even if, you know, we tell someone that they're both sinner and saint like that, you know, that paradox like messes with people's heads. So they believe they'd rather believe that they're a sinner more than they're going to believe they're a saint because of their experiences. You know, being a saint who is alive and, and free in Christ does not mean spiritual maturity or sinlessness, but it does provide the basis for hope and future growth. 
you know, that's our starting point. Like I said, uh, I think I said last lesson, um, you know, we come to faith and then our, our journey, our spiritual uh, walk begins, you know, and, and it, it culminates in our glorification when we when Christ returns or when we go see him. Um, despite God's provision for us in Christ, we're still far less than perfect. You know, we are saints who sin. Um, our position in Christ is settled, uh, but our daily performance is often marked by personal failure and disobedience that disappoints us and disrupts our harmony uh, with our relationship with God. And I definitely just, I just talked about that in lesson three. You know, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Our, our relationship with him is assured when we come to faith uh, in Christ. We are seated in the heavenly realms with Christ, as in right now. Um, but our harmony, the way we behave, can disrupt that. So, you know, if we're walking uh, in sin, we're not going to feel like we're in the kingdom. We're not going to feel like we, we have been changed. Um, but the, the, the key here is believing that we have been changed, that the, what God's word said is true about us personally, and that we can, we can live by faith, um, and walk in righteousness. Um, you know, like the common verse for those people who, you know, and, and you know what, those people, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of Christians who think they're a sinner saved by grace. And that is true. But when you become a member of the kingdom, you are a saint. So a lot of people hold on to that sinner card and they're not letting go. And one of the verses that they love to share is Romans seven nineteen, which tells us, you know, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Romans seven twenty four, you know, carries on that lament where it says, "Wretched man that I am, who will save? Uh, who will set me free from this the bo the body of this death?" Um, he's asking the question, so I'm going to ask the question: Who will set you free from this bo the body of death? Jesus Christ is the answer. Um, our faith in him is the answer. He will set us free from this body of death, and that includes the sin that leads to death. Um, in our attempts to understand the failure that often disturbs our sense of sainthood, we struggle with such biblical terms as flesh, nature, the old man, or the self. Um, what do these terms really mean? You know, are they distinct in themselves or interchangeable elements that of the same problem? Well, today uh, we're going to explore some of these terms that often confuse Christians who are attempting to understand the sinful side of their sainthood. You know, a clear biblical grasp of these terms will help you understand, help you in understanding who you are and lead to greater spiritual maturity. And that's it. We, we, yeah, faith's sort of hard to figure out. There's lots of paradoxes, but a paradox is things that seem contradictory, but amazingly can be true. Like I'm a sinner and I'm a saint. Uh, I, I've, I've commit sin, but because of God, he saved me. And I've been forgiven of not only my past sins, but every sin that I haven't even performed yet. That's what Amazing Grace is all about. Um, that somehow, you know, when we die, we're going to be spiritually alive. You know, on earth, it looks like this guy's dead. But guess what? You know, they say, to, the word says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So there's paradoxes in our faith. And that's where faith comes in, that we have to. We believe it. No, God says, you know, when I go, go, he's prepared a place for me. I'm going to go. I'm not going to die. You know, John 11. I love John 11. You know, he goes to Martha before Lazarus raised. I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? That's the question to you. Do you believe this? You know, our, our, the gospel is complete in our resurrection, not just in our, you know, in our death, you know, being forgiven for our sins and going to heaven. It's, it's giving, you know, our coming to faith gives us new life. Um, so, the, you know, we're going to look at the nature of the problem. The, the Bible says we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and we're, by nature, children of wrath. That before we came to Christ, we were spiritually dead. You know, we were born, born physically alive, but spiritually dead, spiritually separated from God. We have neither the presence of God in our life nor the knowledge of his ways. Consequently, we all learn to live our lives independently of God. This learned independence is one of the characteristics of the flesh. Um, Galatians 5.17 tells us, For the flesh sets its desire... 
let's see, it sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things you please. Um, I, I've read commentaries on uh, Galatians 5, 17. We do not do the things you please. Some commentaries say that the things you please is to do the right thing. And uh, other commentaries say that the things that we do, do, we're not to do the things we please are the wrong things that we want to do. So either way, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a problem. That flesh gets in the way of us doing the right thing, and it f brings us to do the wrong thing and that we're not supposed to do. Um, so that's the difference of spirit life, flesh life. If we're walking in the spirit, we're going to be walking in harmony with, with God and avoiding sin. Uh, we're going to take every thought captive and, you know, crucify that flesh. Um, you know, the, the flesh and the spirit are in opposition because the Holy Spirit, like Jesus, will not operate independently of our fa Heavenly Father, but the flesh does. The flesh may be defined as existence apart from God, a life dominated by sin or a drive opposed to God. The flesh is self-reliant rather than God-dependent. It is self-centered rather than Christ-centered. Before coming to Christ, I was extremely self-centered. Um, it was all about me and what I wanted, and I didn't care what what I what I had to do to get what I wanted. I I didn't care about other people. Um, you know, that's the rebelliousness, and quite frankly, I was very rebellious in regards to things of faith. Uh, I doubted. I didn't believe. Because I didn't feel saved. I didn't feel, I didn't want to be, I wasn't like those good people in church. So I didn't believe it and I walked in rebellion and I wasn't, I wasn't part of the kingdom. I might have known of God. I might have known the stories of, of the gospels, but they didn't apply to me. And that's our faith. It's got to be a personal a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's not just a mental ascent where we believe and, you know, that, that makes a difference. No, we have to, uh, uh, we have to connect ourselves to him by putting our faith in him and then agreeing with what, it, uh, what the gospel say about, about our salvation and then living it. Uh, otherwise we're just, you know, you know, are we even saved is the question when you're running amok, you know, are you saved? Are you being convicted of your sin? Then it's time to repent, you know? Uh, you know, so that, that, that rebellious thing, that, that, you know, sinful thing, that was our state, uh, you know, before being saved, the state of fallen humankind. That's, that's everybody who hasn't come to Christ. Sinful by nature and spiritually dead, as they say, separated from God. In addition, the heart, which is the center of our being, as the Bible tells us, is more deceitful than, than all else and is desperately sick. Uh, Romans says that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. A fallen humankind live their lives in the flesh, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You know, they are depraved. You know, if you ever heard of, uh, you know, total depravity, that's, you know, we can't help it. Uh, we, before coming in Christ, our, our predisposition is to sin and live independently of God. Every aspect of, of our beings before being saved is corrupted, and and we can do nothing to save ourselves. That's a big part of it. You might have walked, you know, you might have been a decent person by the world's standards, maybe a really nice person, but spiritually dead is spiritually dead. Um, there's one way, one way to the Father, and that's Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Um, and, and that's it, because our debt, our sin debt, because we sinned all sin and fall short of the glory of God, that sin debt, no matter how small or how great, is is you know something you can't pay back. Um, the only one who can pay for it is Christ, because He lived the perfect life, and His righteousness is imputed on you know into our lives when we come to Him. You know, so what happened at salvation? You know, several things. You know, the first thing is God transformed us from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of His beloved Son, says Colossians one thirteen. Um, Second thing, you know, so so that's it. That spiritual thing. We're in the kingdom. Um, like I said, the moment if we die, the moment of our salvation, we're going to heaven because we've given our we put our faith in Christ, and that's it. That's the sinner on the sinner on the cross, right? The, you know, um, you know, the thief on the cross next to Christ. He gave himself to Christ. He said, "You'll be in my you know the kingdom with me today in paradise." Um, 
that's good news, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, that's internal life, but you get that spiritual life that moment. If that, that, if that, uh, if that thief on the cross had been taken down and, and, and rescued, he, he would have repented. He would have changed. Um, but he didn't, you know, our faith, our, our actions, our faith is what saves us, not, not our, our good deeds. Um, second thing that happened is that sin's domain, dominion, uh, you know, dominion over our flesh has been broken. As a believer, you're no longer in the flesh. You're in Christ. That means you can say no to sin. Um, Romans 8 and 9 tells us, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. It, and then and then it says, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Uh, so let's make sure that spirit of God it dwells in us by, by making a profession of faith, making Jesus our Lord and Savior, being specific. Jesus, I make you Lord and Savior of my life. Please help me. Um, you know, that a simple profession of faith is what brings us in, you know, and then the spiritual life, you know, Holy Spirit comes in us and then we can change. Uh, the verse goes on to say, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. You know, like I said, we want to make sure, you know, they say, seek out your salvation with fear and trembling. And that's just making sure we're, we're in the faith. And how do we make sure we, we, we dedicate our lives to him. We, we, we read his word. We follow, um, you know, uh, you know, he, Jesus said in the last lesson, you know, my, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Are you following? Let's follow. He's got a good place for you to go. You know, Paul also equates the idea of being in the flesh with being in Adam. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 22 tells us for as in Adam, all die. So also in Christ, all will be made alive. Christians are no longer in the flesh, but because the characteristics of the flesh remain in believers, we have a choice. Uh, you know, we can live according to the flesh or we can live according to the spirit. We have free will. We can still sin. That's why this paradox of sin and saint, you know, be exists because God is not making us robots. He, he's given us free will and he wants us to choose his love, his grace, his mercy, and his life for us. Um, and it's a continual process. It's not one and done. We're, we're to walk in it. Um, you know, we've been grafted in, you know, uh, to his life. Um, Ephesians 8, uh, 5, 8 says, For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Second Corinthians 5.17, I think a lot of people know. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's the spiritual life he's talking about. Are we part darkness and part light? You know, are we partly new creature and partly old creature? Does the Christian have two natures? Um, the illustration that Anderson puts forth is, is regarding the grafting end. Um, in Arizona, city parks are decorated with or ornamental orange trees that are uh, much hardier stock than the trees that produce the sweet oranges we eat. Because they survive colder temperatures, they are used for root stock. Uh, the ornamental orange is allowed to grow to a certain height, then it's cut off and a new life, a navel orange, is grafted into it. Everything that grows above the graft takes on the new nature of the sweet orange. Everything below the graft retains the physical characteristics of the ornamental orange. Only one tree remains when it is fully grown. The physical growth of the tree is still dependent upon the roots that go deep into the soil for water and nutrition. What grows above the graft takes on the nature of what was grafted into it. Um, you know, people don't look at a grove of navel oranges and say, that grove is nothing more than a bunch of rootstock. They would call them navel orange trees because they would identify the trees by their fruit. That is how we should be known. Uh, Matthew 7.20 tells us, Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. 2 Corinthians 5.16 says, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. In other words, we are not supposed to, to recognize Christians for who they were in Adam, but who they now are in Christ. That is why the Bible doesn't identify believers as sinners, but instead identifies them as saints. Um, the natural person is like a, a rootstock tree. Uh, you know, he may look good, but can't bear any fruit that isn't bitter. The born-again Christian, however, unlike a tree, has been grafted into the true vine, Jesus Christ, and is not only supported by the vine, but is transformed to 
produce sweet fruit for the kingdom of God. Spiritual growth in the Christian life requires a relationship with God who is the fountain of spiritual life. So unless there's that some spiritual core, some core of spiritual life within the believer, within the believer, growth is impossible. There is nothing to grow. That is why Paul's theology is all based on our position in Christ. Colossians 2, 6 and 7 says, Therefore, as you have, been, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him. You know, to build up believers, they must first be firmly rooted in Christ. To grow and bear fruit, Christians must organically be centered in, in Christ. According to Scripture, the center of the person uh, is the heart. It's the wellspring of life. Um, in our natural state, you know, before coming to Christ, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Uh, it, is de it is deceitful because it has been conditioned from the time of our birth uh, by the deceitfulness of the fallen world rather than the, by the truth of God's Word. And, you know, I love to point out, and I, I think Anderson, you know, pushes this too, is that, uh, you know, that deceitful heart is wicked above all else. That's, uh, you know, that's, that's our state before Christ, and things change. Um, one, of the, one of the greatest uh, prophecies concerning our salvation is found in Ezekiel thirty six twenty six. It says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from your, you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. You know, that's... That's 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 an Old Testament verse that's pointing to a New Testament spiritual reality that was that it was yet to come, and that came when Jesus Christ, you know, uh, did His work on Earth and was resurrected. Um, everyone who puts their faith in Christ gets a new heart and a new spirit. So, is the heart this this desperate and wicked and and evil and beyond cure uh, for a Christian? No, it's been changed, and it's a process, though. You, uh, for me, myself, I was a hard-hearted person before coming to Christ. I, I, you know, frankly didn't like people, and frankly, I, I, I thought I was evil. Um, and I was just, you know, there was a lot of, I was a very hard person. Through the pain of suffering of, of life, I, I, I'd hardened my heart, and uh, didn't want to trust, didn't want to, uh, didn't want to, you know, feel anything. Um, after coming to Christ, you know, that, that, that verse, you know, where it says you, you take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh became a reality in my life. And, uh, I really learned to, uh, love and, and really feel my emotions. And, um, that's, that's part, you know, of the spiritual process of, of coming to faith in Christ is the, the, the softening of our hearts. That's how we can love one another, um, is through our maturation and our growth. Um, the new covenant by which every Christian lives says, I will put my laws in their hearts. Uh, that's Hebrews 10, 16. Uh, you know, the moment you're grafted into the vine, you were sanctified or set apart as a child of God. You know, you're already clean, says John 15, 3. And you shall continue to be sanctified as God prunes you uh, so that you may grow and bear fruit. Um, Galatians 2.20, you know, tells us, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Um, Paul says, I died, but I live. Obviously, a new and different person, you know, a d different person exists now. In other words, my old ornamental tree has been cut off. I no longer live as the ornamental orange. I now live as a new navel orange. You know, I'm a new, I'm a new creation. Um, you know, a parallel concept to this is, is being a new creation in Christ is the teaching that the believer has put on the new self. Um, it says that in Colossians 3.10. And, and more literally, the new man. You know, what does it mean to be a new man or a new woman? Um, does it mean that every aspect of the believer is new in reality? We still look, you know, we still look the same physically, and we still have this, uh, many of the same thoughts, feelings, and experiences. Picture, for instance, that ornamental orange tree that has just been, you know, just had a new tiny stem grafted into it. Because so much appears to be the same, it's, seen, it's sometimes taught that newness refers only to our position in Christ. 
Um, the newness is only what we have seen in relation to our position of righteousness and holiness and justification and positional sanctification. There is no real change in us until we are finally transformed in glorification. But, you know, that's a lie. You know, that, however, would be like teaching justification, you know, teaching justification without regeneration. You know, that we're forgiven, but there's no new life. If we are still ornamental oranges, how can we be expected to bear fruit, uh, you know, bear those navel oranges? We have to believe that our new identity is in the life of Christ and commit ourselves to grow accordingly. If you are a new creation in Christ, have you ever wondered why you still feel and uh, feel and at times uh, feel and think the same time? <laughs> Sorry, uh, still think and feel at times the same way you did before, because everything you learned before you knew Christ is still programmed in your memory. You know, we didn't get a mental delete button and erase all our thoughts and feelings that we learned, you know, from living in the world all our lives before coming to Christ. You know, that is why Paul says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. We have to, we have to change, you know, how we think we have to change what we believe. Um, you know, we learned how to live independently of God for so long, and now it's going to have to, you know, that's from going from fleshly living to, or worldly living, to going to a spiritual life. Um, and guess what? We have to we have to appropriate those things personally. Uh, we have to believe them, uh, not just intellectually, but in our hearts, that this has actually happened to me, and I'm going to live it out. You know, uh, we all have a boss, you know, most of us have a boss anyway. Uh, in the past, I had a foreman who was uh, intent on micromanaging his technicians. He questioned everything we did and how we and how we did it. He wanted us to keep in constant contact with him. So so we knew exactly where everyone was and what everyone was doing. On top of that, he was very condescending. I, I, I've had a lot of foremans through the years uh, and he was like no other. He was the worst. But if I wanted to keep my job, I had to do it under his authority, relating to him as my boss. Then, then thank God, I got another foreman. I was no longer under his authority. But even though I got a new foreman, because of the way I was treated previously, under you know a pretty you know a micromanager and somebody who was uh, condescending, I was walking on eggshells for a while, waiting to see how the new guy was going to be. Um, but I quickly realized he wasn't like my old foreman. My new foreman not only trusted his techs to know what they were doing, he had a reputation for helping his, his technicians in any way he could do to do their jobs. Um, I was able to relax and just do my work without having to worry and answer to someone who was highly critical smog or who treated people like pawns in his own game. You know, when, when you were dead in your trespasses and sins, you served under a cruel self-serving boss. Uh, like my old foreman, uh, <laughs> the CEO of that business was Satan, the prince of darkness, the God and ruler of this world. But God's gra by God's grace, you have been delivered from the domain of darkness and transformed to the kingdom of, of his beloved son. You now have a new boss. Your new self is infused with the divine nature of Jesus Christ, your new CEO. As a child of God, you are no longer under the authority of Satan and dominated by sin and death. The old man is dead. You know, um, new things have come. Despite the fact that all believers at times still live according to the old self, they are new persons, new in relationship to God and new in themselves. The change that takes place in us when we come to Christ involves two dimensions. Like we, we stated previously, first, we have a new, we have a new master. As mortals, we have no choice but to live under a spiritual power, either our Heavenly Father or the God of this world. And that's really it. There's no in-between. Because to serve yourself, guess who you're serving? You're not serving God, you're serving the enemy. Uh, if it's not of Christ, it's it's Antichrist. Um, so yeah, as mortals, spiritually, there's one way or the other. It's either God or any other option is not of God. Um, at salvation, the believer in Christ experiences a change in power that dominates his life. You know, he comes into the kingdom. Um, second, there is an actual change in the believer's nature, so that the deepest desires of their hearts are now oriented toward God rather than toward sin and self and sin. Um, yeah, something changes. Our heart, our heart does go to God if we we make that profession of faith. 
You know, this becomes evident when believers choose to sin. Unlike before coming to Christ, they are not, are being convicted by their sin because what they are doing is no longer consistent with who they really are in Christ. So yeah, you can come to Christ and then go sin, but uh, in my experience, sin just wasn't as much fun as it used to be um, because the Holy Spirit was convicting me, changing me on the inside to, uh, to be conformed to the image of Christ, uh, little by little, bit by bit. But there was a pull, and I could, you can deaden that, that call from the Holy Spirit and live in sin, but you're out of harmony with God, and guess what? When you're out of harmony with God, you don't have any peace. Um, you know, there are thousands of Christians who are questioning their salvation. Yeah, how can you believe you're saved if you're living in sin? You know, you're not going to feel very comfortable about your spiritual your spiritual position in Christ if, if you're living like the devil. Um the fact that it, but, you know, the fact, if you're sinning and it bothers you, that's the best argument for, for your salvation. It is, it is you know, it's natural for a, 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 a person who's not born again to sin. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, sometimes you'll run into people who call, them, call themselves Christians, but seem to have little or no remorse for sin. Um, they'll claim the grace of God and live like the enemy and live like the rest of the world. And you're like, uh, you know, when you encounter people that, that claim Christ but live a lifestyle of sin, you really have to question their, either their, their, their maturity or question their salvation themselves. Now, we're not really supposed to question anyone's salvation. We're supposed to be concerned with our relationship with God and encourage others. Um, but... You know, when someone's living, living like the devil, you, you have to wonder if, if indeed they've received Christ and or not, because the word, the word shows us that we're just we're to, we're to pursue our, our salvation with fear and trembling, and that by by our fruits you'll know them. And sometimes the fruits are you know small, uh, you know like, but but there is fruit, you know whether whether it's just like. You know, a, 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 a desire to, to follow the Lord um, that's present in our lives, that's, you know, exemplified by church attendance or, or, or reading the word. You know, there's, there's some fruit, you know, that, that sitting less, you know, it's a process. And, and if we're in the Lord, he will make us, he will lead us into growth, you know. Why do we need that nature of Christ within you? So you can be like Christ, not just act like him. You know, that's just it. It's not acting, putting on an act. It's not putting on your church clothes and acting like a Christian. You know, God has not given us the power to imitate him. He's made us partakers of his nature so that we can actually be like him. You don't become a Christian by acting like one. You're not on a performance basis with God. He doesn't say, here are my standards, now measure, now you measure up. Uh he knows you can't solve the problem of an old sinful self by simply improving your behavior. He must change your nature, give you a, an entirely new self, the life of Christ in you, which is the grace you need to measure up to his standards. That was the point of Christ's message on the Sermon of the Mount in five, uh, Matthew 5.20. He said, For I say to you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. The scribes and Pharisees were the religious perfectionists of their day. They had no, they had external behavior down to a science, but their hearts were like in the insides of tomb, of a tomb reeking of death. Um, Jesus is interested only in creating new persons from the inside out by infusing them, uh, in them a brand new nature and creating in them a new self. Only after he changes you. Changes. I'm sorry. Only after he changes who you are and makes you a partaker of his divine nature will you be able to change your behavior. And that's it. You know, we have to. If we put our faith in Christ, we become a new creation. We believe it, and then we start to act like it. You know, um, and and it, and it's not an act. It's a natural expression of who we are now in Christ. You know, we have a new master. Because we are identified with Christ and his death and resurrection, we have become new, uh, become new and a part of a, the new huma humanity. In this change, we have a new power of dominion in our lives. That is clearly expressed in Romans 6, 5 through 7, which says, 
For if we have been united with him in his death, in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set for it, set free from sin. Uh, so there you go. Um, you know, if if we're gonna claim our sinfulness, this verse, these verses really, really, you know, sort of uh, contradict that that line, because it says that we're to crucify that body ruled by sin. And that's, it'll be done away with. And we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free of sin. That's freedom. This is the freedom message. We have been set free. So walk in it. You know, old self in this passage literally means old man. The old man in relation to the believer has been crucified in Christ and has been, and he has put on a new man. You know, the illustration in, in baptism is always, you know, we, we died with Christ and are, ra and, and are raised to life, in, you know, in his resurrection. You know, we're died, we die with him in his crucifixion, we're raised to life in his resurrection. That's the complete gospel. It's not just him dying and paying for our sins. It's him giving us new life. Um, Romans 6.11 says, Even so, consider yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. What's that mean? Sin's not who I am anymore. I'm going to be alive in God. Uh, in Christ Jesus, we're gonna we're gonna live like like God wants us to live. We don't consider it so to make it so. You know, we we are continue we are to continuously believe we are alive in Christ and dead to sin because it is so. Uh, believing anything doesn't make it true. God said it is true, therefore we believe it. There's a big difference there. Death is the ending of a relationship, not an existence. Sin is still present, appealing and powerful, but when you are tempted to sin, you can say, by standing on God's truth, I don't have to do that. By the grace of God, I can live a righteous life. And that's just it. If you notice, it says, by the grace of God, I can live that righteous life. It's not because we can do it in our own strength. Uh, we tried to do things in our, in our past by our own strength, and we always ended up failing. But when we do it by the grace of God, that's that's owning our identity in Christ and those old ways of living, the old sinful ways of living become less of, you know, become, you know, non-negotiable uh, or things we don't want to do because it's not who we are anymore. It becomes a matter of identity. You know, in the past, we always knew the bad consequences of sin. Oh, you know, I know it's bad for me. I know it's not right. But it never stopped us. Why? Because we didn't change the way we thought. Um, you know, when we come to know our, our identity in Christ, that sin is, is, is a contradiction to who we are. Um, we, we, not only do we know the bad consequences of the sin, we, we, we don't relate to it anymore as, as who we are in Christ. And not only that, as we, as we talked about harmony with God, that sin also disrupts our harmony with God. So for three reasons, we know it's bad. We know it's not us anymore, and we know it gets in the way of our relationship with God. That's how we can overcome sin. Um, Romans 8, 1 and 2 uh, tells us, There is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You know, all the negative comments or, or thoughts or, you know, impressions you have about yourself, that's not from God. You know, that's either from the pro programming of this world or, or from the enemy himself to tell you that you're no good and you can't do this and and all that. But there's no condemnation. So any of those thoughts, we reject. You know, uh, Verse 2 uh, says, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. You know, uh, Dr. Romano at our, our Bible college locally, he, 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 he explains that verse as saying the authority, the authority of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free over that authority of sin and death. You know, you know, the, when we come to Christ, the authority that sin had over us has been broken. Um, you know, is the law of sin and death still operative? Yes. That is why Paul calls it a law. You can't do away with a law, but you can overcome it by a greater law, which is the law of life in Christ Jesus. Christ has got the authority. You know, all authority and power has been given to me, as the word says. So he's got he's got it. He's got the, you know, he's got the power. Um, he outrules, uh, you know, the dominion of darkness. Um, you know, there's not even close. Um, 
one illustration that Anderson's uses, is, uh, you know, as mortals, we can't fly in our own strength, but we can fly uh, in an airplane because an airplane has a power greater than the law of gravity. If you don't think the law of gravity is still in effect, you know, turn off the engines at 30,000 feet. <laughs> You'll crash and burn. You know, if we walk by faith according to what God said is true and the power of the Holy Spirit, we will live, we will not carry out the desires of the flesh, as Galatians 5.16 says. If we believe a lie and walk according to the flesh, though, we will crash and burn. You know, and that's that's the key here. If you if you notice, it said, um, you know, to we, we, we walk by faith according to what God said and the power of the Holy Spirit. So, so what's that? We believe what the Word says, and then we do it by His power. Um, you know, it's, it's not in us. You know, how is this possible? How, how can we change? It was by God's, by, by God's power, the Holy Spirit in us, that makes the conviction happen, that changes our thoughts, that reveals truth to us, and that moves us to, forward with Him. Um, you know, we're saved and sanctified by faith, as, as I said earlier. Um, Paul says in Romans 6, 6, our old self was crucified, past tense. It was done. You know, we try to, we try and try to put the old man to death and we can't do it. Why not? Because he, he's already dead. Because many Christians are not living that abundant life. They incorrectly reason what experience has to occur for this to be true. Um, the only thing that we had that had to happen for that to be, be true happened nearly 2000 years ago. Um, and the only way you can enter into that experience is by faith. You know, the answer lies in Colossians three, three that tells us for you died to this life and your real creation is hidden with Christ in God. You know, that, that, that old life is dead. Um, you know, our, our new life is in Christ. So some may ask, how do you do that? You know, we suggest you read that passage again, just a little bit slower, you know, for you died to this life and your, and your real life is hidden with, with Christ and God. Some Christians are desperately trying to become somebody they already are. We cannot do for ourselves what Christ has already accomplished for us. You know, too many Christians are trying to show that the Bible is true by the way they live. It will never work for them. You know, we accept what God says is true and live according accordingly by faith. And this abundant life works out in our experience. If we try to make it true by the way we live, we will never get there. And, and that's it. You know, we can't do the things. We can't do the things to become what we are. We are a Christian, so we naturally do the, do the, do the things that are, you know, fruitful for our growth. Um, Paul points out the futility of that thinking in Galatians 3, 2. I would like to learn just one, one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? You, are you so foolish after beginning with the Spirit? Are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? You know, that, that passage in Galatians was all about, you know, people had come to faith in, in Christ, were saved, and then uh, other, other Christians of, of uh, you know, of Jewish background basically said these guys have to follow the, the Mosaic law to be accepted. Um their faith apparently wasn't enough, but but Paul is pointing out here that uh, you know you didn't come to to faith uh, by by those those works of the law, you came to faith by uh, by you know you came to to life in in the spirit by faith, and that's just it. Acts fifteen, they you know the the Bible tells us that you know the the church uh, the early church determined because the Holy Spirit guided them that that Gentiles didn't have to follow. The Mosaic Law to be accepted by Christ. It's by grace alone that we're saved. You know, we are saved by faith, and we walk or live by faith. We have been sanctified by faith, and we are being sanctified by faith and by faith alone. That's it. I believe it, so it's so I'm going to walk in it. You know, I believe I've been set free from sin, and I don't have to do this anymore. I, I'm just going to believe and and walk in that sanctification progressively bit by bit you know as we go we are neither saved nor sanctified by how we behave but how we believe you know that's it do you believe this as as christ asked do you believe it good then let's walk in it 
Um, you know, Martha believed in it. Next thing you know, her brother was raised to life. And I love that illustration of Lazarus being, you know, raised to life because Christ in a moment called Lazarus forth and gave him spiritual life. Lazarus come forth. He was alive, literally, physically, spiritually. And, you know, the illustration I've heard is that, you know, when he, when he was raised to life, he was still wrapped in his grave clothes. Well, those grave clothes are our old sin. You know, they're still bound tightly to us when we come into Christ. But we can have other people help us to, to take them off. But, you know, we take off that sin because it's nothing but an outer covering of our old life that can be discarded. You know, that's, that's do you believe this? Yes, I believe it. God's work of atonement changes sinners to saints. You know, the radical change, regeneration, is affected at the moment of salvation. The ongoing change in the believer's daily walk continues throughout life. You know, the progressive work of sanctification, however, is only fully effective when the radical inner transformation by generation is realized and appropriated by faith. Wow, I really have been changed. I really have been set free from sin. Um, I, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to walk it out uh, by faith, and I'm going to trust trust that that has happened to me, and I'm going to go to the Lord in prayer to confirm it and to and to continually walk in it. As a new Christian, you are like a lump of cold, unattractive, somewhat fragile and messy to work with. After time and pressure, however, coal becomes hardened and beautiful. Although the original lump of coal is not a diamond, it consists of the right substance to become a diamond. Right now, you're a diamond in the rough, but given time uh, enough time and pressure, you'll be like a diamond, revealing the glory of God. Uh, theologian Anthony Hokima uh, comments, you really, you are new creations now, not totally new to be sure, but genuinely new. And we are not, we who are believers should see ourselves in this way, no longer as depraved and helpless slaves of sin, but as those who have been created anew in Christ Jesus. You know, that's, you know, oh, that's just how I am. No, no, you're, you're a new creation in Christ. So let's, what, let's believe that and let's walk in it. You know, we have to balance the indicative and then the imperative, as they say. Um, the greatest tension in the New New Testament is between the indicative. The indicative, of course, is what God has already done and what is already true about us, and the imperative, what we sh what remains to be done as re as we respond to God by faith and obedience and the power of the Holy Spirit. You have to know and believe positional truth to successfully progress in your sanctification or you are going to try doing it for yourself, what God has already done for you. you know, um, we, we have to believe what God has done has, has already happened and uh, move in it. The balance between the indicative and the imperative is about equal in Scripture. But sadly, it isn't in most churches. Most preaching focuses on those imperatives. Do this, do that. Um, people could go to a good church for years and never hear the message that they are children of God who are alive and free in Christ. We need to worship God for all he has done. Rest in the finished work of Christ. Um, we need to hear again and again the wonderful identity and position we already have in Christ. Then we'll be, able to, we'll be better prepared to receive the instructions and assume our responsibility for living that Christian life. You know, We've got we to gotta believe we're in it before we can act like we are. Um, you know, in, order to, to, in order to live it, we have to believe that we... We are alive. Um, you know, I was asked, you know, when we, when we go through this material, we're, we're, we're often asked about the eradication of the sinful nature at the new birth. You know, was it eradicated? Well, we can't give a simple yes or no answer to that question. If you're asking, do you believe that the old man is dead? The answer is yes. I am no longer in Adam. I am spiritually alive in Christ. If you're asking... Do you believe that the Christian can still sin and walk or live according to the flesh? The answer is obviously yes, uh, as we can see that in our churches today. You know, new, new believers are dominated by the flesh. I know I was. And deceived by the devil. I know I was. Um, it takes time to renew the mind and overcome the patterns of the flesh. You have to know, you know, you have to know the truth of what the word says, says who you are before you can really appropriate it all. Um, but freedom can come quickly. Maturation, we'll work that out. 
Uh, if you ask, if you ask me, do you believe you have a new nature? I would answer yes, because God has given me a new heart, and I am now spiritually alive. My new self is oriented toward God. If you ask me, are you a sinner or a saint? <laughs> I would joyfully respond, I believe I am a saint by the grace of God, and I intend to live my life as his child in the way he intended me to live, by faith and the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, by faith by our belief in the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, that's a faith, you know, it's a supernatural thing, guys. You know, we believe it, and then suddenly we can just walk in it because, you know, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do this. Um, the Holy Spirit's alive in you. Um, you know, I taught last night that the Holy Spirit speaks to us in three ways. After we receive Christ, um, there's three ways the Holy Spirit speaks to us he speaks to us through our, our our conscience you know guess what that's not right what you're doing you know you feel guilty and you feel convicted of your sin that's the holy spirit in us trying to transform us um the other way he speaks to us is through intuition you know after we come to christ he'll lead us to do good things like we'll go to church we'll listen to this christian message we'll read the bible hey let's pray for that person hey let's let's do something good I don't know about you, but before coming to Christ, I didn't really have anything good in mind for anybody. Um, but after I came to Christ, suddenly, like, you know, I'm getting these intuitions to do these things. That's the Holy Spirit leading us to walk in our walk in the Spirit. Uh, the third way is when we worship. You know, it's through our communion with Him. When we read the Bible and the Bible comes alive or a verse jumps out at us, that's the Holy Spirit, you know, communing with us, giving us truth. Um, when we're in church and we worship and we're 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 worshiping and we're really we're really extending our, our hearts and suddenly we get a revelation of who we used to be in Christ or we or we get a word uh, a word from Scripture that uh, you know comes in or we're emotionally overcome by joy and uh, you know uh, that's the Holy Spirit communing with us you know so that's the thing I'm pushing the most, uh, you know, in our, in our class is that our, our faith is an experiential reality that we, you know, we can experience the interaction of God in our lives. And because guess what? It's real. Um, you know, I, I could go on and on about that. Uh, don't forget that our entire being was, however, morally corrupt before we came to Christ. Our minds were programmed to live independently of God, and the desire of our flesh were in opposition to the Spirit of God. The flesh, our old nature, has to be crucified by the believer. What's that like? Well, you know, basically back in the, you know, a lot of people get reformed. You know, we get, you know, we come to Christ and we turn from our sin, but then, you know, in our memories and our thoughts, we go, oh, I remember the good old days when I used to be like a real, you know, wild guy or whatever. Uh, and we'll have you know, fond remembrances of our sin. Well, are we being changed? Uh, we, we need to renew our mind there because what, what's going to happen? Uh, if I fondly remember my sin, guess what? If, uh, I'm going to walk back right into it, um, you know, uh, eventually. Um, because, or I'll just live depressed, you know, um, I'll be so, I'll be like, yeah, I'm, I'm with God now and I don't do anything fun anymore. It's like, no, um, what we need to do is shine a light of truth on what the way we used to act. Because when we were in sin, there was sh shame, guilt, condemnation. There was, there was fear. There was anger. Um, there was all the negative consequences of the things we did. Um, the joy, you know, the pleasure was the pleasure, but usually there was a lot of, a lot of desperate and quiet times before, during, and after um, that that we that we don't highlight. If we shine the light of truth on the way sin, you know, ruined our lives, um, there's no way we're going to like it. You know, the the word says to hate your sin, basically, not the sinner. Um, I'm not giving a Bible verse on that, no. <laughs> but, but I mean, basically, you know, that's, that's it. How can, that's how we change. That's how we crucify the flesh. You know, we, we, we recognize, we recognize those temptations and we go, you know what? I know better now. And guess what? That's not, not only do I know it's not right for me, but it's not who I am anymore. And I don't want to disrupt any of that harmony that I have with my father. Um, you know, we don't believe in instant maturity, you know? It will take us the rest of our lives to renew our minds and conform to the image of God. Um, but the seed that was sown in us by God is, uh, is the beginning. You know, being a child of God and being free in Christ is a positional truth and the birthright of every believer. You know, we are a child of God. We are free. And we're going we're gonna, to, you know, turn to God. 
you know, and, and, and change. Um, because of a lack of repentance and ignorance of the truth, many believers are not living like liberated children of God. How tragic. Like I said, you have to repent, you know. Um, leave, leave that old life behind. Uh, you're not going to carry it into eternity, so leave it. Um, and if you're ignorant of the truth, you have to learn the truth. Last night, I, I encouraged the, uh, the class to, uh, to read the New Testament. Because if we want to know who we are in Christ, we got to know the Word. Um, we can read the whole counsel of God. I recommend that. But for, for beginners, let's, let's, let's stick with the, the Gospels and the Epistles to, uh, to show us the, how to live with Christ. And ask for the Holy Spirit to reveal um, how it's true for us. You know, if we if we have to know that we're free and 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 agree with it and walk in it. Um, Anderson makes a great analogy regarding the end of slavery in the, the United States when it was abolished by the Thirteenth Amendment on on December eighteenth, eighteen sixty five. Although there there were no slaves after that date, many still lived like slaves. They doubted the news. You know, the news of the proclamation uh, applied to them. They, they were lied to by planta plantation owners. They didn't learn the truth. Others knew and even believed that they were, were free, but chose to live as they had been, as had always been taught. You know, still years later, after the proclamation, many still had not heard the wonderful news that they had been freed. So naturally, they continue to live uh, the, the way they always had lived. And some have, some heard the good news, but evaluated it by the way they were, feeling and, and and what they were doing and they reason that i'm still living in bondage you know, doing the same things i've always done my experience tells me that i'm not i must not be free i'm feeling the same way i i was before the proclamation so it must not be true after all your feelings tell you the truth after all right uh, no so they continue to live according to how they feel uh, not wanting to be hypocrites right one, one former slave, however, hears that good news of the proclamation and receives it with great joy. He checks out the validity of the proclamation and finds out that the highest of all authorities have written the decree. Not only that, but it personally cost the authority a tremendous price that he willingly paid so that he could be free. You know, that, that guy's life is transformed. Uh, he correct, correctly reasons uh, that it would be hypocritical to believe his feelings and not believe the truth. Determined to live by what he, he knows to be true, his experience began to change rather dramatically. He realizes that his old master has no authority over him and does not need to be obeyed. He gladly serves the one who set him free. You know, we all have been set free by Jesus Christ. It is time to believe it. Live it and tell everyone what real freedom is. Uh, we no longer have to live in bondage to, to sin. We can be instead, rightfully, slaves to righteousness. And that's just, we are compelled to follow where the Lord leads us into a righteous and holy life. Lord God, we, we thank you. Uh, that's the end of lesson four. Uh, we thank you uh, for uh, listening. Uh, we encourage you to share the podcast. I'll be sure to make sure our lessons are, are recorded in a different format, perhaps. Um, so you'll get the, the live class uh, from Thursday night um, and possibly interaction of students. Um, we had some input last night. Unfortunately, that will not be recorded. Um, but we, we ask you for your patience. We, we cover your prayers for the ministry and um, we just we encourage you. Um, if you want to share your progress, to email me at mtforchrist247 at gmail.com. Um, and let me just pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, this message of freedom that people in the body of Christ desperately need to, to understand their freedom in Christ and to affect change in their lives and to uh, help others uh, to walk in it. Lord, we, we, we just pray that... Um, for anyone hearing this, that the Holy Spirit comes in to give them a revelation uh, and, and, and an experiential knowledge of his of the reality of him in their life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening. My cat is meowing, and we're going to say have a great day, and we'll, we'll teach again next week. God bless you all.